So, when I started out, the models of social change, of course, there is the model of Evan and Bus, sanctification. Before that, Hokart, looking at what you call Hinduization. I mean, similar, but pre independent formulation and all that. And actually, one of the other to me, very interesting thinkers is Norbert Halias, who wrote a book in 1939 called The Civilizing Process. So all of these are talking about, in effect, tribal people's attempts to raise status. But as I began to look at the situation, I began to understand, without understanding the context of imposed change, it is almost insulting to talk about tribal people's attempts to raise the status because they're doing it in the context of massive imposed change, which in British times started in certain ways and in post-independence in, in the name of development and so on. So actually, my PhD, which became my first book that Professor Joshi referred to, for Sacrificing People, um, I, I was at that time, I did my own film and sociology in Danish group economics, where my main teacher for A.M. Shah, as well as uh, Vina Das, Andrew Bette, and J.P.S. Sogoy. So J.P.S. Sogoy in particular was encouraging his students to study up and study the structures imposed by the West on India and other places. So my PhD, which became my book, in effect studied a very broad kind of social structure, which was the social structure of the British as they imposed change on a tribal area in Ayurveda. So as I analyzed the social structure, one part was the administrator, which would be the police, the forest department, the administrator, what would now be the politicians. One part was the missionaries, which would now be the NGOs, those who bring about education. And this is a particularly important one because Education, I, I was saying to Professor Joshi, I've been immersed in looking at tribal education and what is meant by that in the last few years. So, when the missionaries started tribal education about the middle of the 19th century in different ways in different places, in effect they were moulded by Macaulay's kind of idea of education in India generally, of trying to um, educate an elite who would then be the the agents of change. I'll come back to that. But then the third, as, a, as it were, part of the social structure, administrators, missionaries, NGOs, and anthropologists. So again, Professor Joshi's talk was a wonderful introduction because a chapter of the book is called Anthropologists in a Social Structure, which means what does it mean when we study other people? In fact, for me, and maybe for many of us, um, are also influenced by Hugh Bodhi, who we referred to as a very close and influential friend for me. I, I was first, when I was doing field work, thinking of studying the Baiga, like I do. And I remember going to a Baiga village and saying in my quoting Hindi, like, and the people asked me two questions that changed the way I thought. First was Unhone Hasa. Kaha up such research they hit doors out to reach me, how much culture up some accepting. Or do we or how many can I? So those two questions really changed. Like to to say now I'm studying these people. I almost find it adds insult to an injury in some way. But that's what we used to do, or what this used to do. And to say we understand other people, the only person recently I've met who actually said we understand the tribal people was the real head of Tata Steel when I was sitting opposite to him in a very intense dialogue, Mutaraman, and I remember he said we understand other people. No anthropologist now would say we understand them because it, what, what Professor Joshi was saying, it's we understand it is for them to understand themselves and also 
us in a way to reverse, in some sense, the direction of objectification. So, many things in what I've said. So, among the change agents, one would be the Forest Department, which again, Professor Joshi mentioned that when the British brought in the forest policies and they, they challenged the traditional tribal rights over the forest, that was the beginning of massive imposed change. And obviously all the forest policies since then have followed the same kind of direction. And when the missionaries introduced schools, similarly, because they, they did create what they aimed to create, they created what we very loosely call the tribal elite, which is a very problematic concept and a very problematic reality, as we all know. So, um, moving on from there, I would say one of the few, it's it still coming back to what is social change? How is social change happening? How has social structure changed? One of the studies that I, I don't know if any of you know, but another acquaintance of mine, who is an anthropologist I respect a lot, Piers Vitebski, who wrote in, about the Langea Soda in Orissa, a book called Dialogues with the Dead, about shamanism in about 1980s. And 35 years later, just last year, he, after intensive many visits, he wrote another book called Living Without the Dead, because the shamanism is almost dead, and there's now no girl over the dead because most of the land is sort of Christian. But he analyzes other changes too. Quite, not maybe systematically, but it's a very, very good um, view into how to understand change. But the other thing is, when we analyze social structure, of course, like Lancelot was saying, the kinship system is often taken as the heart of the social structure, and very difficult to analyze because, you know, it's intangible, who is marrying who, and so on. But actually, to me, one of the ways in to understanding social change seems to me material culture. Because if you look at, say, the pre independence monographs that are the standard, really wonderful, often monographs for all their problems, like Elwins, Essie Roy's, and Grierson's, and so on. We find, for example, in every tribal village, they would make their own houses, grow their own own food, there would be specific castes who some make their cloth, out of often bark cloth, or some make it themselves. Um, Every boy knows how to make a, a comb and carve a comb for his beloved. Uh, so many other aspects of material culture. So there are blacksmith castes, there are even goldsmith castes, there are uh, many other castes who <coughs> sell or make specific things. Now, of course, the material culture has completely changed. Well, not completely, but in terms of the self-sufficiency has been undermined. It's been undermined in terms of houses, especially by the idea of the Paka house as what people should aspire to, like the Indian Ewa's mix, how Paka houses for them, but which is much less, it's not their culture, it's like an imposition. It's um, much colder in winter, much hotter in summer, and there are no special ritual spaces in it. It's not a, a vernacular sculpture anymore. Um, and of course, transport completely changed. Now, the land just saw it, for example, where Piers is talking about. There's roads, there's cars, the Dongolier comes in the Nyingili, now they depend, even in the years I've known them, for like commander jeeps to bring them as a kind of bus service right into the heart of Nyingili, and, and so on and so on. Um, one, one clue to me is a sentence, because I studied in the kind of reverse anthropology I did of the British imposition of change, I studied very closely the British documents and ethnography from the 1830s. So the first Britisher who was in charge of imposing change, the conquest actually of the commons in Orissa, somebody called Russell from the Madras government, he wrote the way we have to pacify them now is by introducing markets. And markets were introduced new wants 
which will gradually become necessities of life, which will give us a much greater hold over their fidelity as subjects. These words I come back to again and again because it applies to all of us. It, I mean, we all depend now on our mobile, which we didn't 20 years ago or something. And the mobile changes the way we relate, understand the world, many, many things. But, um, so that's just a little bit about uh, the importance of material culture. And then, of course, the other changes, the migrants, huge out migration, landless for example, the market itself becoming very adverse to farmers generally, so it's very much harder to make a living. Subsistent agriculture is undermined in many ways, so they have to get more cash. Like when I first went to Adivas villages in Orissa Chattiska, they hardly knew what money was, literally. I mean they depended on it, often to give bribes to the police or forest department or something, but I mean they had to use money. But I remember one man showing his non tribal friend currency notes to understand how much money he had. He literally didn't read it. And of course the political structure, instead of the, the headman, the, the Panchayat Raj, the election system with all the problems of, in terms of corruption and political party manipulation that comes with that. Um, then there's also, now the, the role of the anthropologist now, I, I felt I understood it in a new way, going to, uh, some, several of us have just been to uh, the um, very impressive uh, Indira Gandhi uh, Centre of Anthropology in Bhopal, but a few days before that I was in Bhubaneshwar where the SCST Study Centre, it has also a very impressive museum, but there's certain aspects of it that I find incredibly problematic. and. I've, got, I've sometimes been to that museum with Adivasi friends and I can sense their shock as they look at all of their cultures put in museum cases around the walls and these life-size models of a man and woman from each tribe. It's like specimens. It is, to me, almost openly racist, really, in, in today's terms. And it, it came to me that actually it's almost like a ritual of anthropology since Guria and Takabaka to say that with the comments Elwin made about the Baika Chak, that Elwin was trying to put the tribes in a museum. But actually, people are still putting tribes in the museum. And it is, I'm afraid, often the role of the anthropologist. How, does he, how do they get each item? Do they buy it? Do they just take it from villages? Often they take it from villages that have been displaced by a dam. There's a lot of violence in this putting the private cultures in cases. And of course, it's again very much non-tribal people who are deciding that, or tribal elite people who have then been educated themselves in, in degrees. And this thing of understanding the social structure, it's NGOs in the tri operating tribal areas, how many NGOs that work for tribal people in, I'm especially thinking of Central India, probably there's a few more in the Northeast, but how many are run by tribal people themselves? I know actually only one, the Birsa NGO in Ranchi and Jharkhand. All the others are still run by non tribal. So, in terms of defining who they are, like the British started that. I mean, the most violent concept was obviously the criminal tribes who still become the DNTs. And, and as again Professor Joshi was referring, the tremendous balance of who is, who gets the ST status, which now everybody depends on for benefits and, and so on. And so the museumization, in a way, goes hand in hand with the imposed change. And those, in a way, it goes with the, those who, the very people who are accused of it, wanting to museumize the types, are the ones doing it. And especially, I'm thinking of Guria and Takagawa, who, openly advocated assimilation at that time when against, for example, what J. Rosen Mundo was saying, who wanted the term Anibasis to be the general term here. And even Ambedka, it seems, went behind his back and the ST category became the standard one. So I've been looking at education in particular as a 
prime kind of mover of social change recently. And one out of many, many different aspects of that is, for example, in Nyingi, where I am currently, uh, you know, many, many of you will know that I have a, I've lived next to Nyingi for over nearly 20 years. So, a lot of the day schools have now been closed. So, more and more, the concept of the residential school is being promoted. And in a way, as uh, Virginia Skakas report uh, five years ago put it as, as it were an undeclared policy of assimilation that is the policy and especially when you look at schools so understanding if you look at say North America which some of you have mentioned Canada and United States in particular you can talk about Australia and New Zealand too but the residential schools there started just around the same time as the mission started schools for private children in India. But now the purpose was very different. In America, from the 1860s, 70s, very strongly, the policy was forced assimilation. And when the policy changed with the disbanding of all the residential schools by the 1980s, the Prime Ministers of Australia and especially Canada issued a formal apology to the, all the indigenous people of these countries saying it was a policy of cultural genocide and we apologize for it, imposed through the residential schools. But now from exactly the same time, say the 1980s, when national schools are already in their thousands in India, even bigger models of residential schools are being promoted. So in a way, the policy of the missionaries from the mid 19th century, as I said, the policy was to create the tribal elite. The policy in America was cultural genocide. It was, as it was put then, kill the Indian to save the man. I mean, of course, by that they meant the American Indian. But in a way, especially when you look at the world's biggest boarding school in Bhubaneswar, the Killing Institute of Social Sciences, a, a boarding school of 27,000 SP children, the policy again is one of assimilation. It is actually, in a sense, to destroy the culture, but absolutely not saying that, saying the opposite. So, Atut Samantha, the head of KISS, has many times said, if anthropologists want to come to Orissa and study the tribes, they don't need to go to the villages anymore, they just have to come here. Now, I never understood that here, because when you go to KISS, which I've been twice, you see 27,000 children, or one uniform of girls, one uniform of boys. Girls and boys aren't allowed to meet. They're not allowed to bring food in. Um, if, if they bring food from home, which they go home once a year in the summer, all about to search when they get to the gates, any food from home is thrown in the bin in front of them. And the, the way, just like in North America, the relationship with home is cut off, so that they're actually decontextualize systematically on the culture is they're not allowed mobile. Now if if we're teaching in the school and children bring out mobiles, of course we don't want them to have mobiles, but what it means in KISS, because it's a residential school, it's actually to break any contact with their their home culture. And I've heard many people describe who have worked in KISS or know the children there, very often when a mobile is found on a child, it's smashed in front of them. So, I mean, there's many, many, we can talk about KISS, and I've, I've begun to write about it quite a lot, and I think a lot of us should talk about what's, what's happening there. Um, so, one of, the, one of the aspects for the Dongri and Nyingri, of course, one aspect is that Dongri is have a population of around 10,000 who live just in Nyingri. Now, the policy and it's the police, it's the SP of districts who are orchestrating the sending of children to KISS. So, and or the sending them to Ashford School. So of that population of 10,000, at least 1,000 children, Dongri children, are in residential schools, either in Ashland schools around Nyingri, or maybe between one and 200 of them in KISS itself. So that means that there's very few children in the, in the villages, and 
some days ago uh, at an amazing meeting on private education in Odessa, in Odia. Um, a, a dormitory boy came there, quite far from his home where he'd never been before. And age just 16, he was arrested by police as a Maoist. Not being a Maoist, but it means only the Maoists, <coughs> only the Maoist youth would be at home. That's the assumption. It's like, and that's where you see this is actually a policy of, I would call it cultural genocide, but it's being imposed in, at the moment on the tribal um, children. So, in, in a way, another concept I think we need is not just development, but de-development, because this is something I feel I've understood that's like when um, the idea of development, partly to me it comes from the concept of evolution, and Darwin's concept of evolution, in a way I would say was misapplied to society <laughs> by thinkers from Marx to the World Bank, that the idea of there's only one way of development. Like, so like, um, Darwin's talking about thousands of species all inter in interaction with each other. And it's not that elephants or mosquitoes are trying to become humans. I remember a lovely cartoon of a gorilla saying, looking at a human and saying, thank God we're not like that. Like, uh, this degenerate species of human being who destroy the planet, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, the idea that like Marx, I think, formulated very well what he called primitive communism to slave running, feudalism, capitalism, if maybe possibly socialism again, but we don't know. But um, we have said they haven't seen a way how. But in the World Bank scheme, underdeveloped, developing, and developed countries and regions, it's. And this is why, still, maybe in anthropology, there's often this unquestioned assumption of these people are a backward or something. So when we're talking about, as somebody said to me in the break, like, in terms of, if development is to be in the hands of private people, but if it's in the elite, and they're educated out of their own culture, in, in many ways, then, for example, I remember uh, one of the strongest leaders of the American Indian movement, by which I mean the Native American movement, called Russell Means, um, he started an amazing speech in 1980 saying, if you're reading this, somebody else has written it down. I normally reject whiting as the white person's culture of appropriation. So it's like, of course we can do that, but all this education is happening in the name of literacy, and whatever literacy gives, it also destroys what what Russell means calls the spoken relationship with people, the oral traditions. That so that maybe is at the root of the change, because, like, what was taught in Gojo, for example, I think, to me, one of the best ethnographies is the Moria and the Gojo. Of course, I'm talking about Eastern India, but you'll understand it in Gujarat um, in a different way, but what is taught in the Gojo and what is taught in KISS is just about 100% different, because all those skills of the child learning from the parent, from the uncle's aunts, from the older children, the myths, riddles, which they do very well in, for example, um, the Basha school, the Basha school, which I've been to, and been really looking at these alternative models that are beginning to bring this back. So, and of course, what Ganesh Devi also talked about, the linguistic genocide of so many, because so many generations of children have been beaten or humiliated for speaking their languages. Actually, for me, the most moving moment in the Bhopal meeting that we had of 200 Padavasi intellectuals some days ago in Bhopal was I had invited some I, I was a youth who were in an organization called Muskan, which to me is actually the best alternative model of tribal education I need, where they use the um, tribal languages very freely and the children teach the languages to the teachers. It like reverses the hierarchies of learning, it makes learning much more fun. So about a dozen of these Muscan young university teachers came in. And when we were going around in the tribal education workshop, about 30, nearly all adversities there, but most of the others, like adult men and all speaking in Hindi, these young adversities 
they introduce themselves in the Parthi language, a deity language, or in Gandhi. And it was almost like a feeling of an electric shock. It's like, you know, my class is normally they were speaking Hindi, but to speak in your own language, it's, it's a reclaiming of power. Okay, some people cannot understand some words, but you make them try to understand. Like, those Adivasi children in school, they have been spent so much agony of their life trying to understand what the teacher is saying and, and so on. So, you begin to reverse the power structure. So, I, I think that's all I, I need to say now. I, um, I hope you'll have ask, as um, Professor Joshi also said, some challenging questions and we can have many discussions. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. In fact,